And welcome back here to Live Now from Fox. I'm Andrew Kraft. Uh, Fox has some new reporting in. Uh, I'm going to go back briefly uh, to the uh, J.D. Vance running mate pick today. Uh, this is according to Fox News digital reporter Paul Steinhauser. It's interesting. It tells you kind of the timing of this decision today. He says an extremely well-placed source in J.D. Vance's political orbit telling Fox News the senator was not informed he was being named as Trump's running mate until approximately 20 minutes before Trump made the announcement on his Truth Social platform there. So a little bit last minute uh, from the former president. Remember, we reported to you uh, early this morning that as of around 7.30 Eastern, a decision still had not been made. So I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, back out live there outside the Pfizer Forum in Milwaukee, inside the Pfizer Forum in Milwaukee. Uh, remember, we're going to be bringing you so many of these speakers live, but we do have to get to really what has been one of the biggest stories now of the year, uh, and that, of course, is the assassination attempt against former President Trump's life. Uh, and we've been relying so heavily on some of our Fox News correspondents down there on the ground in Butler, Pennsylvania, like C.B. Cotton. She has the latest. Let's watch. We're getting more information about the man who shot former President Donald Trump here in Butler, Pennsylvania on Saturday. Trump was delivering remarks when shots rang out. He fell to the ground, his ear raised by a bullet. The first shooting of an American presidential candidate in more than 50 years. Officials say 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks was the lone gunman. We learned Monday he purchased 50 rounds of ammunition just hours before the shooting. But it's still not clear what his motive was. We don't know his opinions or affiliations. We don't know whether he had help or support or if he communicated with anyone else. Meanwhile, criticism of the Secret Service is ramping up, mostly centered on this building, where crooks fired from a rooftop with a clear line of sight only 200 yards away from the rally. A federal law enforcement official told Fox on Monday, local law enforcement had responsibility for securing the rooftop. And sources tell us one officer climbed to the top, saw crooks armed with a rifle, and then retreated. The biggest question is, is how does an assailant get on a rooftop that close to the former and future president? That's an easy shot for somebody that can be just really a, a recreational shooter. The Secret Service, though, pushing back against that criticism, saying it bolstered security for former President Donald Trump back in June, and it's now working to keep a situation like this from ever happening again. In Butler, Pennsylvania, I'm CB Cotton, Fox News. CB, thanks so much. So we're getting these new details in coming to us uh, from Fox there that the FBI has gained access to Thomas Matthew Crooks's phone in the Trump assassination attempt uh, as well there. So I wanted to make sure we got that I into you as well here. Uh, but we also know that shortly thereafter, a late Saturday night, uh, the identification was made that Thomas Matthew Crooks, 20 years old of Bethel Park, Pennsylvania, was identified as the subject involved in this assassination attempt uh, of former President Trump there. In the meantime, we do want to break down so many of these key plot lines with uh, none other than Hal Kempfer, National Security Advisor and analyst and retired Marine Intelligence Officer. He joins me, and he's been guiding us through this story ever since it broke on Saturday. Uh, Hal, thanks for being with us. I know you haven't really gotten much of a break here. Uh, but there's a lot of key developments uh, to get to as well. Uh, Hal, I want to bring up this fact as well. We now know uh, specifically the weapon used and its provenance. Law enforcement sources with knowledge of the situation, Hal, tell Fox News uh, the rifle Crooks fired at Trump was a DPMS AR-15 5.56. The weapon was purchased by Crooks's father in 2013. Uh, and that weapon is now at the FBI's forensic labs in Quantico, Virginia, uh, along with his phone, his laptop, and at least one improvised explosive device from his car. And we just brought you guys the news that the FBI has gotten into his cell phone here. This is fast moving. Hal, your thoughts? A Andrew, very fast moving. I, I wasn't surprised they could identify the rifle so quickly. Uh, AR-15s are somewhat famous for uh, what we call active shooter incidents, if you will. Uh, we've seen them all over the place. Uh, 5.56 five, rounds, or 5.56 five, round, that's a uh, standard round. It's a uh, NATO standard round. 
uh, that's been used in rifles. The AR-15 is uh, it's equivalent to the M16, or depending on which variant, or the M16 uh, A1. Uh, so it's a very common weapon. It's a very common uh, AR, uh, what is euphemistically known as assault rifles. Uh, it's a magazine-fed weapon, which means that you can fire a lot of rounds in very quick sequence, as fast as you can squeeze the trigger, which is what he did. And so a lot of information on that. Now, the uh, phone, uh, they got the phone for this too. And uh, so there's a lot of information we're gonna find out um, uh, from that. Uh, right now, they haven't put out much, and but no. I've seen a situation where somebody didn't have a motive. There's gotta be something out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of odd. Yeah, I wanna put up this tweet from Jackie Heinrich on the phone question. She has this reporting from the FBI. Uh, that FBI technical specialist successfully gained access to Thomas Matthew Crooks's phone, and they continue to analyze his electronic devices. Uh, the search of the subject's residence and vehicle are complete as well. The FBI has conducted nearly 100 interviews of law enforcement personnel, event attendees, and other witnesses. That work continues, they say. Uh, the FBI has received hundreds of digital media tips, which include photos and videos, taken at the scene, and they say we continue to review incoming tips as well here. Hal, I want to talk about this, uh, you know, talking about the jurisdictions that responded, not only the U.S. Secret Service, but local and state law enforcement as well. So a law enforcement source uh, to Fox News says that locals had responsibility for the roof where the gunman fired. Local law enforcement had that responsibility. That's according to a federal law enforcement official familiar with security plans. That building he fired from was a quote unquote rally point for one of the local counter sniper teams, according to the source who also pointed out that team was actually stationed in or near the building. There were four counter sniper teams at the Trump rally in Butler, PA, Saturday, two from the Secret Service and two from local law enforcement. The source to Fox also added, Hal, uh, that the Butler County Sheriff's Department has confirmed that one officer climbed up onto the roof, this is stunning, <laughs> saw Crooks armed with a rifle and retreated. Soon after that, Crooks began to fire, according to that same source. Moments later, uh, a Secret Service counter sniper fired on and killed Crooks there. What do you make of that course of events, fast moving? yet again here, knowing now, according to this source to Fox, that this building wasn't overlooked, that there were teams assigned to this building, local ones at that, but still assigned, Hal. I, I've heard conflicting uh, information on that. It wasn't clear if they cleared the building. That was one of those things that was coming up that it wasn't entirely clear if a local law enforcement got through there. One thing I wanna point out is when these events happen, uh, yes, there will be local law enforcement to include sniper teams and all sorts of things that would be augmenting uh, this event. That's not unusual uh, to see that. However, w anything dealing with a protectee of this status, Secret Service is in charge. They have the lead, and everybody understands that. So even if that was assigned to local law enforcement, that doesn't alleviate the responsibility of, of Secret Service to make sure that whatever plan they have is being properly executed. Clearly, there was a gap, a big gap, where he was able to access the roof and get up there. Now, there's there's video out there of people in the crowd prior to him shooting who had saw him climbing around up there and were yelling at law enforcement, hey, there's somebody on the roof with a rifle um, or a gun. They were being very clear as to what they're seeing. So there was a lot of information out there as far as what was happening, uh, I don't understand. The timeline doesn't quite add up. Even, but I would point out, even if there was a, a a counter sniper team in the building, he was on top of the building. And I right. question, where was that team positioned? And frankly, if it's a counter sniper team, why wouldn't they be positioned on top of the building where they'd have a better vantage point uh, of whatever they'd have to cover? So that that I, I, I that's not surprising to hear that there were a couple of counter sniper teams from the state local side. It is surprising though, that that building, that rooftop, which is such an amazingly obvious position for a right. shooter was not covered. So Hal, there's so many uh, kind of details to this and layers. Um, remember they were investigating, they, these law enforcement sources, uh, the fact that there were 
bomb-making materials both in his car uh, and at his home. The latest information is that in his car nearby the scene, there were explosive devices, IED, plural, plural devices found. Uh, we don't know how many or what kind, but explosive devices. Uh, in the house, it was bomb-making material. Sources that were not ready to say fully uh, explosive devices in the home, just material that could be used to make a bomb at, at this point. We also know about where he purchased the ammunition and when uh, he purchased the ammunition shortly before the shooting, how the gunman purchased it before he attempted to assassinate President Trump we don't know how many rounds were used, but he purchased the ammunition, Hal, on Saturday. Now, mm -hmm. we don't know the motive, of course, uh, but we know from over the weekend this is being investigated as domestic terrorism or possible domestic terrorism. If it's being investigated that way, does that lend itself to uh, a motive further down the road or, or not here? Well, they're going to uh, investigate it that way uh, until they can prove that it absolutely wasn't. You may recall the uh, shooting the sniper shooting at the Rot 90, right now, Rot 91 concert over in Las Vegas in 2017. They investigated that, and at the end of it, they weren't sure if they could call it terrorism, although they did find that he had uh, domestic extremist views. He was a, a an adamant anti-government, sovereign citizen extremist. Uh, that had come up in the investigation, but they couldn't find that clear link to say it's domestic terrorism. They're going to do the same thing here. Uh, now that they have the phone, now that they're in his, his laptop, his social media, you know, they're going to be looking at everywhere, you know, if he's in various chat groups, whatever it is, they're going to be looking in there to figure out what was he saying, who was he saying it to, what was he thinking, what was he espousing. I've never seen an instance uh, with very rare exception. I guess you could say that uh, uh, the uh, Route 91 shooter was kind of an unusual case, but in almost every case, they're usually venting out online in the virtual world, if you will, before they're acting out in the real world. And there should be something there. So I'm expecting to see some more information come out about this. Uh, it was interesting, though, that he bought the rounds on Saturday. Uh, that's really kind of late in the game for somebody who's planning something like this. You would expect that he'd try and get that ammunition sooner. And the devices they found in the car were some sort of as I understand, some sort of improvised hand grenade type device with a detonator. It wasn't, wasn't really clear based on what I saw if the hand grenade things would have even worked, but he was, uh, he was thinking beyond just uh, shooting. He was thinking of this as uh, probably a more complex style attack, and that's not unusual. We've seen that before where they, they plan to you know, use, do shooting and then bombs, and uh, usually it ends up with the shooting because well, frankly, a lot of times the uh, bombs don't work and the uh, weapon and the rifles do. Yeah. And so they rely on what's easiest. So we have finally heard on camera in the last 24 hours from the director of the Secret Service, Kimberly Cheadle. Uh, many lawmakers are asking her to appear before their relevant committees to answer questions. Um, Hal, I guess what questions do you have for Director Cheadle? Maybe you have a lot uh, about this response here. Chad Pergram says the House Oversight Committee has asked uh, for DHS and Secret Service info ranging from a complete list of all law enforcement personnel, including Secret Service, DHS, and local law enforcement with roles in protecting President Trump at the campaign rally in Butler. We also know the House Oversight Committee has formally announced its hearing titled Oversight of the U.S. Secret Service and the Attempted Assassination of President Donald J. Trump how that hearing will take place Monday, July the 22nd at 10 a.m. Eastern times here. So presumably this is going to be in front of the entire world. This is not going to be a, a closed hearing so we can watch it live. What will be asked of her, Hal, and of these well, individuals who, who come before the committee next Monday? Well, they originally were talking about having a, a hearing, some sort of virtual thing uh, today which I thought was really kind of jumping the gun. Then they said they're gonna move it back. So I'm glad they've got at least a week to kind of get some more information up there. But they're gonna ask, uh, they're gonna ask who did the advance work? What was the advance work? One of the questions I would have immediately is what sort of overhead imagery, what type of maps, what did you have that you worked with? What, what in your planning made you miss that building complex right there? Uh, why wasn't that better covered? Why wasn't there somebody on the roof? 
Uh, there's a lot of questions there. The advance work is going to be a big piece just in and of itself, because obviously whatever the plan here was uh, had some holes in it, and then it would be the execution. And the big part would be who was doing the liaison with uh, state and local law enforcement? What were they saying? What were the meetings? What were the briefings? Uh, had they gone through and done a walkthrough with them? Had they had they done all these sort of attention to detail type things to make sure that that everything was being properly covered before former President Trump uh, showed up? So that'll be a question. And then uh, there's another thing that that has been percolating up today, which was uh, where his vehicle was located. There have been some questions. Was it a little bit further away than it should have been? Okay. And so when they're moving him off the stage, should they have rethought that? And this is really going to come down to the on-site commander for Secret Service. Yeah, uh, I have a feeling whoever that is is going to get grilled pretty heavily. Okay. Uh, Hal Kepper, we got to leave it at that. we got to get back to some of these speakers there uh, at the convention in Milwaukee. Wanted to do a brief update there. We know there's so much interest in, in this story. Hal, thanks for your time.